Here. I had lunch with him one time. Good guy. Great guy. Yeah. Great guy. All right. See, we don't have much. Let's see. Can you hear me here? See how close do I have to get? Right here? Trying to balance the audio for the camera and for out there. <laughs> well, I'll just hold it like this then. Works for me. All right, folks, we're going to go ahead and get started. First, I got a couple of a couple of um, housekeeping things. Um, got the canned food drive going on in case you had brought something. And we're going to have our donations right over there by the hot chocolate. Feel free to help yourselves to the hot chocolate. Uh, get it gone. Stay warm, because I want you to stay. Staying warm is part of that, it seems. A little bit? All right, well, let's see what I got. Is this better? Let's see, is this better? I can get close, I can always get close to the mic. Okay, well, we're gonna try this. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I wanted to thank you all for coming out here today. And as cold as it is, although I'm really glad it's not snowing or raining out here. Um, when Michelle and I were planning this rally, we made it a point that it was, it was gonna take place no matter what, cold, rain, snow, whatever the turnout, we were gonna have it. Um, and I think this is something that should appeal to everybody. The ideas of war and peace, especially. There are reasons that we should all be against war, and especially this war that we're in. Um, we're here today because of two ideas. One is armed to the teeth with some of the most powerful physical weapons ever devised. This idea exists by money, power, influence, and fear. The other idea is calmer, but no less powerful. This idea is powered by reason, liberty, and compassion. The ideas of war and peace must be discussed now more than ever and today because peace couldn't be more necessary than it is at this moment. Every day is another reason to strive for it because every day brings more destruction to everything that we hold dear. Several folks have come to speak today, but first I'd like to set the stage for what we're going to do in here. Michelle and I would like this to be an opportunity for people of widely divergent views to come together and support something that we can all stand behind. The ideas of peace. We don't have to agree on everything because we're not starting a political party. We don't even really have to unite, but what we must do is spread. Spread into our own communities and bring the conversation about war and peace into the public square, no matter who you are. One of the things that makes the war such a difficult subject for some is the tendency of people to react in an emotional way based on the traditions and a misconceived sense of patriotism rather than weighing evidence, reasoning, and morality applied consistently. We need to get work past this with diplomacy, but mostly we need to speak the truth about war boldly and get people to think about it. Each one of our speakers has come to believe in peace from a particular perspective and on a different path and each has a perspective to offer. Um, right now, I'd like to welcome Michelle Graves to the microphone now. She's the one that's been co-organizing the event. You probably have to hold it up like this. Thanks, AJ. Um, and I'd like to thank um, AJ a lot, because he did a lot of work on um, organizing, getting things, you know, structure, and, and there's a lot of other people that helped get this together, and I just want to say thank you. Um, I want to thank the speakers that are coming to speak for us, and just to be um, brave enough to speak what they feel in the hearts. I also want to thank my husband, because I would have never been able to um, make it here this morning, or even be doing something like this if it weren't for him. And most importantly, I want to thank you for coming today. Um, most of us have heard the saying by Edmund Burke, all it takes for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. And I am neither a politician or a great orator, but I am a citizen of this country. And as such, I will not remain silent while great atrocities are conducted in the name of peace. Right. We are engaged in these wars under the guise of human rights, women's rights, retribution against terrorism, to set up a viable democracy within these nations for their peoples, 
But as Malila Ijoya, former member of the Afghan parliament, and she's also an author, states so perfectly, occupation will never bring liberation, and it's impossible to bring democracy by war. Also, the former Afghan prime minister once stated that NATO forces are seen as invaders, and if they do not leave the country, there will be no solution. We're intruders in wars that should not involve us, in other countries that are not our own. These nations have been fighting their own civil wars lasting for thousands of years, and our presence there now will not stop them. They do not want democracy. And due to many incidents leading up to January of 2012, the Afghan people have a deep growing resentment towards the coalition forces because of all the civilian deaths that are occurring over there. And it's fractured our already uneasy relationship that we have with them. What if a more powerful nation invaded our lands and told us that we must change the way that we live and the way that we think and our beliefs and then stay in our land for a decade? What would we do? What would we feel? And that's exactly what's happening over there and we're becoming the terrorists ourselves. Sorry. <laughs> the cost alone. These are just the two things that I want to talk about today. Um, the cost of the war. The cost alone is so astronomical that it's hard to even wrap our brains around the numbers. The Nobel Prize winning econo sorry, economist Joseph Stiglitz reported that in 2007 we were spending 720 million a day for military maneuvers. That's $500,000 a minute. And in Iraq alone, from 2001 up to December 2nd of this year, our nation has spent, and let me see if I can say this right, one trillion three hundred ninety nine billion eighty six million six hundred ninety five thousand six hundred and one dollars and here's some examples that i like to point out the recent hurricane that we just had on the east coast we're told that it's going to cost us 62 billion in damages that's how much happened but we are hard pressed to find the money to rebuild the areas yet in only 86 days 86 days Spending a day what we do in the war, we could rebuild everything that has been destroyed over there and all the lives that have been destroyed. And with the money spent in the first four years in the invasion of Iraq, had it been left in the private sector where it belongs, we, through the free market, could have furnished everything needed to rebuild those er areas devastated by the storm. And while I do believe that the money should remain in the hand of the citizens, I will use that amount that was spent in the first four years just for comparison. We could have furnished 1.27 million homes with renewable energy. At $2.3 billion, we could have given a million children health care for a whole year. And look where it's landed our economy. Our own people are in dire straits due to borrowing of funds for these wars. Our taxes are now being spent on repairing other nations' infrastructures and religious buildings. And why are we being taxed, and not for our nation's benefit, but for another country's, when we have needs also? Under the presidencies of Bush and Obama, our leaders tell us that we will be out of Iraq and Afghanistan by the end of this year, 2012. But we see our troop strength only increasing from 84,000 to 102,000 at the by the end of 2011 that's what it was and I don't know that we should allow politicians who can't even do basic math to be running our country this is the longest running war in our nation's history and it has no end in sight the Cato Institute stated has this war become an interest unto itself that is to say we must win the war because it's the war that we're in rather than asking if the war is winnable we should ask ourselves if the war is worth winning. Is human life an acceptable cost in exchange for war? I say no. Why are we at war at all? Is it to defend our America from invading forces? No, it's not. Benjamin Franklin said that they that can give up essential liberty to purchase a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty or safety. American families are losing their children in war. We blow up neighborhoods of regular innocent people just like ourselves, calling it a success for the subsequent capture of one enemy. 
Parents are burying their children. Children are becoming orphans and living in the streets because they're losing their parents. Do we think that's acceptable? No. Look into their faces. They are not acceptable casualties of war. They are human lives that we are wasting and killing senselessly and for no right cause. These are ineffectual, unending wars that have cost us nothing but the death of thousands and led us into economic ruin. The blood of our sons and our daughters, our children, and the blood of another nation's children cry out to us for peace and an opportunity to live a normal life to end this violence and death, and let us honor our people by bringing them home. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michelle. Next, I'd like to welcome World War II veteran Jack Stewart. When the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor on Sunday morning, December 7th, they, they killed 2,500 Americans, sunk a bunch of our Navy ships. The next day, Monday morning, thousands of men were lined up at, at military recruitment stations to join the service to fight back. Even though we were totally unprepared for war, we defeated the two greatest military powers on earth in three years and nine months. We've been in, in Afghanistan 10 years and still don't know what we're doing. <clears throat> President Roosevelt did the, uh, conducted that war with a declaration of war from the Congress and a policy of unconditional surrender no negotiations. All subsequent wars have been fought under United Nations authority and they've all been lost through negotiations. The first example was Korea. The, the United Nations wouldn't let MacArthur win that war. The Chinese were sending troops in across the Yalu River and he wanted to bomb the bridges and bomb the, the Chinese and the United Nations said, oh, you can't do that. You may offend the China. <laughs> now, there are people in America who want war. You must realize that. The military-industrial complex, which President Eisenhower warned us about, they make lots of money off of war, and they spread that money around amongst the congressmen to support the war. <laughs> Senator Jay Rockefeller from West Virginia a couple of years ago made the statement, the war on terror is the perfect war because it can never be won and it will last forever. It's all about power and money. The, the military industrial complex makes the money and they give the money to congressmen to support the war. Now, we have bases in hundreds of countries that are no threat to the United States whatsoever. In, in, we have 30,000 troops in Japan and Okinawa. The Okinawans have had big demonstrations asking us to leave. We have 40,000 troops in Germany. The war has been over 65 years ago. Why are they there? What do they do when they get up every day? They're, they're not in harm's way. I support the troops in harm's way. I'm a veteran myself, but these troops are there for political and purposes. Now, we have bases in hundreds of countries that are no threat to the United States. We should bring all those troops home and think of all the millions of dollars we'll save. But what do these troops do in, in, in Germany when they get up in the morning? They're not in harm's way. What do they do? Now, the, the people that want war are starting to, to starting the propaganda to get us in, in the mood to go to war against Iran. Iran has signed the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty 
and they submit themselves to, to frequent inspections. And there is no, absolutely no concrete evidence that they're building a nuclear bomb. But you won't read that in the paper. The, the, the people that want war are trying to stir us up to have war with, with Iran. So my message to my congressman and to all of you is bring the troops home to defend America. Thank you. Now, uh, I myself, I have a um, kind of a peculiar way in which I have come to the views uh, of peace and to, to be anti-war. A very recent convert to the anti-war movement. My particular path is really not very common for somebody in my background. All of my life, I've very recently been pro-war. The ideas I held were byproducts of my history books, talk radio, Tom Clancy novels, and a typical type of apathy for anything outside my own interests. If the warfare state was a club, I would have been its cheerleader. I was also raised with Christian views and folded these into my support for American military adventurism across the globe. To me, anti-war types were just hippies, ignorant of history or some, some kind of pinko commie who just wanted to see the America fail.